Hey everybody, I'm NJ, and this is my friend Chris Welsbeck. Uh, you may know him as the director, the audio director for Factor 5. Uh, he worked on a lot of different games, uh, the Star Wars uh, Rogue Squadron games, um, and most recently, he's had success on Kickstarter for his creation, The Piano Collection. So Chris, thanks for joining me today. Hi everyone. So, uh, tell us a little bit, the Piano Collection, it's, it's the biggest piano Kickstarter that's ever happened, it's 600% funded right now, and it's still got a couple weeks left, uh, how are you feeling about the whole project? Yeah, it's really awesome, and we, we couldn't have asked for a better start, and, and the result is uh, really great, and uh, uh, we, we hope to make this even bigger, of course. All right, awesome. For for those of you who don't know about uh, the piano collection, Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about it, what it entails, and and what you can get if you fund the Kickstarter? Yeah. So uh, yeah, the idea came about actually uh, quite a long time ago. I I um, I listened to soundtracks of uh, movies and stuff like that, and uh, one that that uh, piqued my interest was a piano rendition of the old Transformers soundtrack from the eighties. And uh, that was really masterfully played. And the other thing that happened over the years, my fans have asked uh, if they could get cheat music off of my compositions. And since I'm not a classically trained composer, I've always like um, I'm self-taught, and I, I always did my own playing on the keyboard, and then I did it all with a computer. So I never did this like classical uh, writing down on the source and stuff like that. Um, so I thought, like, how, how could I combine that? And the idea was to create a piano album and put out the scores for those piano renditions. And um, that happened a couple of years ago. I met this um, cool pianist who uh, did all kinds of uh, arrangements of game music. And uh, I talked to him, and he was uh, on board with the project. His, his name is Patrick Navian. He's also a German. And so that's that's how it got started. And then we worked on this actually for several years and uh, never got to the point where we really said, okay, we want to put this all together into one thing and get it printed and stuff like that. And that's when I realized uh, Kickstarter is the right platform for it because uh, there we could get the funds to get it actually nicely printed and bound and uh, make the CD and all those things. And that's what's happening right now. And it's a fantastic, fantastic thing that, that's been happening. This is your first Kickstarter project, right? It's my second, actually. I did, uh, I did one two and a half years ago for uh, one of my older games, uh, which was uh, very, um, you know, the, the fans love this. is the Tarakin uh, soundtrack mm -hmm. anthology. And it's based on Tarakin, which was an early 90s um, uh, 2D platform shooting, shooting game. And uh, so I did that, and that was uh, that was a huge project with four CDs and orchestra recordings and this and that, and that's out now. And uh, you can find it on my Bandcamp and on Spotify and everywhere. So uh, that was uh, very well received by the fans as well. And you can find those links in the description below. Uh, did you did you have a lot of concerns going into this project? I know you've done it before now, so so did you use what you learned from the first project and apply it to this one? I I did in part, but we also uh, did it with a little bit of a different concept here, since we have um, we had these like limited edition books, and uh, we're we're putting them out in like different uh, levels where you can get lower numbers and stuff like that. So that was different, but of course. Other things that I learned during my first Kickstarter are very well applied. Um, uh, among them is that um, you know I'm I'm keeping the rewards um, you know uh, in perspective, whereas on the first one I was going crazy with uh, so many different rewards and we had a tough time fulfilling them all at the end. But this time we we learned a lot and this will also ship on time because we have done already a lot of the work um, beforehand. So we have a lot of the pieces ready to go, and um, we're aiming to uh, put this out in summer of 2015, right before Gamescom in Germany, which is the uh, largest trade um, and, and fair for uh, fans as well uh, over there for games. Right. Excellent. Summer 2015. Can't wait. So, so, so the, the project started, and you had, I believe, what was it, $10,000 was the goal? 
Yeah, the goal was $10,000, which was just covering the initial batch of uh, manufacturing. Uh, but to our surprise, we reached that in 66 minutes, which uh, could almost be a record for this kind of uh, project. Yeah. And um, and then it went up from there, and now it's at like almost 600% uh, of uh, what we were asking. Uh, so there's gone, we added a lot more things now. So there's now a vinyl option. So we're doing actually, we're putting out a double vinyl, which contains all the pieces from the album. And uh, so there's very nice collectible opportunities here. Right. Um, you, I expect you weren't expecting this kind of turnout for, for this project, reaching 600% in just a matter of a few days. Uh, yeah, exactly. That was uh, really um, unexpected and uh, we're obviously very happy about it. And now we can do a few more things and uh, we have stretch goals and stuff like that. So uh, we'll see how it goes in the last two weeks that we have left now. Yeah. Uh, you've, you've got quite a big team working on this. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who you're working with and, and what it's like working with such a talented group of people? Right, so uh, I mentioned already Patrick Nevian, who is um, from Germany. He's, he's a pianist and keyboarder, and he has his own band. And I've known him from, for a few years now, um, and we work very well together. And uh, he's doing all the arrangements and performing, and um, the recording. We're, we're doing the recording with him. And then I also have uh, my friends from Sound of Games, uh, which is another group from Germany who does a lot in game music. And uh, we've done uh, also some performances together at other Gamecom and other events over there, uh, where we actually perform on, on stage with iPads and stuff like that, which is always fun. And um, Michael, uh, one of the guys from Sound of Games, he's a, he's a, a trained um, musician. so. Um, he he studied it, um, and so he's really good in uh, transcribing the pieces to uh, to the ver to the score versions that are getting going into this book. And we're doing actually two. We're doing always two versions. One is the exact arrangement as it is on the album, and the other one is a beginner's version. So for every piece, you get two uh, versions depending on your level of playing. Right. And if I, if I also mention, I should mention that the book not only contains those uh, sheet music pieces, but we're also for every piece we're including a bio biography kind of um, page or pages that describe um, how the piece was created, what, um, what, what it was for and how it came about and some technical insights. Uh, so that's why we call it the biographical scorebook. Right, and I think that's that's something that's very unique in this sense. I, I've not only does it have this this two versions of the same piece for people who are just starting out and those who have lots of experience in in the field, but also it has all this information on how the pieces were made. And I think that's something that should be taken up more often. I think that's such a really neat feature about this. Yeah, I think that gives the opportunity for fans who are not necessarily piano players to really enjoy this project and. And uh, so they can listen to the album, read the story behind the pieces, and then if they want, it uh, might be even fun. Um, I mean, even for me, who uh, I, I don't read uh, sheet music in that sense. I know all the um, symbols and I know the notes and stuff like that, but I cannot play from the, from the sheet music. Um, but I, I can read along, you know, and it's fun to see, you know, when you, when you visually follow the score, while you're listening to it, that's that's always been uh, fun for me as well. Let's talk about Patrick Nevion for a minute. Uh, you became aware of his work through Amiga Meets Piano, correct? Right. So he had done uh, several um, uh, arrangements for piano of, of uh, a lot of Amiga music, and he he put that out uh, on the internet as a download album, and that's how I became aware of him. And I immediately liked his style and. Um, uh, the, the enjoyed the music and um, that's when I really had the idea oh maybe he's the right guy for my project because um, he really gets it you know he's he's a fan first and foremost and he's a, he's a fantastic piano uh, performer uh, much better than I am I mean I I know how to 
get my ideas into the computer and can play a little bit, but I cannot play like like he does. Mm -hmm. He's he's really um, uh, virtuoso. So uh, um, so I talked to him and he was uh, on board and we did a test. Um, we did the first arrangement in 2011 with the Jana sisters, and uh, that will also be on the album. But now we're making it really like a full album, so it's. Um, uh, a f full CD and uh, I think it's like 17 music pieces or so. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's let's talk a little bit more about your career because you've you've been in this field for almost 30 years, right? Right. Uh, 20, 27 or 28 years now. I started in the mid 80s. I got a Commodore 64, which was a dream come true, because um, ultimately. I wanted a synthesizer, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, my my family could not afford that. They they were very expensive. And when I read in ad that the Commodore 64 had a synthesizer sound chip, and I was also getting into uh, computers and programming, I uh, knew I had to have one. And, uh, and finally, I saved up enough money to get one. And uh, yeah, so that's how how the whole thing got started. And then. Um, I also wanted to become a game designer, game programmer, and I started programming first in the basic language, then assembly, and um, uh, but I wasn't as good as like a game designer. Uh, but my my music stuff um, became then the focal point, and I did my first projects uh, for games, and uh, also. I think the biggest thing that got me started was I won a contest in a magazine over there in Germany, mm -hmm. the 664 magazine, and they had a contest for music on the Commodore 64. We would send in your, actually your program on a disc, and then they would vote on it, and uh, to my surprise, I won that contest. And uh, that, that was uh, called Shades, the, the music piece. And uh, that's how how my whole career got started. You've worked a lot on on N sixty on excuse me Commodore sixty four. Um, what was there a game in particular that you remember fondly working on, or a particular piece of music that you remember fondly? Well, I mean, I I think like the defining project on the Commodore sixty four is probably Jana Sisters. Mm -hmm which was a kind of a Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers clone, which also got them into legal trouble with Nintendo at some point, and they had to uh, take it off the market again because it was just too similar, and they threatened the lawsuit. Wow. Um, interesting piece was uh, the only thing that wasn't like Mario was the music because I wanted to do my own uh, uh, take on it, and... Um, so that's probably the best known project of my Commodore 64 time and also one that I fondly remember working on. That's incredible. I actually didn't know about that. Nintendo's not always the one to, to take the direct approach when it comes to legal action, but um, that's really interesting. Well, it, it, was, it was pretty uh, brazen the way they did it, you know. I mean, a lot of the uh, level structure was um, uh, almost one-to-one, -one. And uh, so they changed, instead of like Mario Brothers, they called it the Gianna Sisters, which is also an Italian name, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think the, the last um, straw was when the English distributor um, uh, put out an ad in a paper and said, move over, brothers, here come the Gianna Sisters. And that's really what, uh, what pushed them over the edge. And uh, in the meantime, but they, they have made peace uh, because the latest incarnations of Jana Sisters are actually out on Nintendo as well, um, uh, which is, uh, it was just like uh, two years ago, the Jana Sisters Twisted Dreams came out, mm -hmm. um, which really doesn't have much to do with Mario anymore. It's, it's, it's newly imagined, uh, but it still uses the, the, the main characters from the old game. And, uh, but it's, 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 very, it's a very fun rework. So if you're, if you're more into modern platformers, you should check that out. Definitely. And I did the music for it, of course. Of course. Got to have everyone on board. Uh, now, as as you you worked as the audio director for Factor Five, tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so um, when so Factor Five, uh, they are originally from Germany as well, and I think I had um, our our most successful project uh, of the early days uh, was with the guys from Factor Five. It was a game called Turrican, which we mentioned for the the Turrican soundtrack anthology, right. and uh, they moved to the US in 1996 to work closer together with Lucas Arch, uh, which they had um, a relationship already with and um, I followed them in 98 when they were starting to do uh, Star Wars Work Squadron on the N64 mm -hmm. and uh, that was um, they needed somebody who could make this orchestral soundtrack that incorporated the John Williams compositions but also some new stuff into a cartridge because the N64 was the last game console I think that used cartridges apart from maybe some handhelds right um, uh, and they they really needed somebody with that expertise to, to get uh, a lot of music into a small space, and that's uh, why they hired me for it. And I was originally only supposed to stay for a year, but I liked it so much in the U.S., and the project uh, went so well that they wanted to do more, and so they, they hired me full-time. And that's, uh, that's how I got to the U.S., and that's how I stayed. <laughs> And now they did work a lot with Lucas Arts. Did you have a lot of pressure on you as the audio director, knowing that you were trying to create this music that was inspired by John freaking Williams? Oh my God, it was intense. I mean, I'm I'm such a John Williams fan, and um, you know, I he's almost has almost like a godlike status to me. Right. And um, so I was like, uh, to, to paraphrase the words of Wayne's word, I'm not worthy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was crazy. And I, I, I developed some, while I was working on the game, I developed some uh, health problems over it. You know, I, I had like tendonitis in my arms from all the keyboard mm -hmm. playing and using the mouse and the keyboard and stuff like that. Um, luckily, that went, uh, that got better over time. But uh, yeah, I was. It really stressed me out. And uh, right after it was done, I took like a, a month long vacation um, over Good in Germany, for you. also to also to wrap up things because I knew I wanted to stay in the U.S. But I needed it badly, and um, I haven't then also listened back to the music for years. And then, like I think. Um, I don't know, five years ago or so, I listened in again on on, um, on the old compositions and I thought, man, you, you, you didn't do so bad there. I, I really liked what I heard um, when I listened back to a Rogue Squadron. Um, so yeah, that was, that was crazy, but fun too. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And jeez, phone is going off. Um, as... as... As someone who, who can look back on, on his own work and, and say, wow, this was terrible, or wow, I'm actually really proud of this, I, I relate to that very strongly because I feel like going forward in life and looking back on something, you have a completely different perspective on it, and, and music especially because it can have such an emotional impact. Yeah, absolutely. So, And you're, you, you said you're self-taught for, for your creations, right? Yes, I am. I mean, I... I studied a lot of books on, on orchestration and, um, you know, I, I can put together a very decent arrangement um, of orchestral music and then, but usually I do hand it over to somebody who has studied it and then they, they do the, um, the final work um, because I've, I've actually worked with orchestras. I um, recorded um, two games in the last couple of years. Uh, one was the uh, the War of the Worlds um, mm -hmm. for Paramount Interactive, and uh, the other one was actually a Star Trek game, which unfortunately uh, is unreleased. Um, they they um, pulled the plug on the project in the last few months, and um, but the score was completely recorded, and I actually put it out on Bandcamp now. It's called Infinite Space Resurrection over there. Couldn't use the Star Trek name, but um, that's that's what it originally the, the music came from. Right. And this was also in collaboration with with the guys from Sound of Games. And uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm self-taught um, a little bit. I, I'm sharing a lot of um, uh, things with Hans Zimmer because I'm from the Frankfurt area where mm -hmm. he grew up, and he doesn't read music either 
or he's not classically trained and um uh yeah i think somebody in the press called me once the the hans zimmer of game music so <laughs> maybe that's yeah so but i'm i'm also a fan of his stuff of course right not a terrible legacy to go off of right exactly <laughs> yeah um do you have any advice i think we're about time to wrap it up here but do you have any advice for those who who are who are self-made people who are trying to get into the music industry or who are trying to get into making music for games do you have any advice to give them yeah, absolutely. I mean, my my first advice is um, if you have some talent and you believe in yourself, you just have to keep going at it. I mean, this is not something that comes overnight. Um, you have to work on it probably for a few years, and and uh, just keep going at it, and you're you're gonna get better. And it's like um, it's that tena tenacious. Um, uh, working towards that goal and I think um, uh, that's also how I uh, approach my career so I always keep pushing forward and um, then there's also some resources you can uh, go to like there's the Game Audio Network Guild or short the Audio Gang so if you go to audiogang.org um, you find a lot of resources if you're starting out and then you also have to, and, and this is, I think, the most important advice, if you, um, if you just send your demos anywhere, you know, it's never going to get you um, anybody really paying attention. You have to actually befriend the people who are making games. So if you're starting out, you won't probably find an indie team or somebody um, that you um, um, start working with. And start small and establish those relationships because those people probably move on to other positions, or um, their companies grow and stuff like that. And that's how you how you really get a foothold in the industry. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, guys. Thanks for watching. Any of the information you want to find is down below. You can find all the links we mentioned in this interview. You can find the link to the piano collection, which still has a little bit of time left. Uh, thank you, Chris, for sitting down with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. This was awesome. Awesome. And thanks to the fans. All right. Thank you so much.